Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of the Breaking Muscle podcast. Today, I'm excited to tell you that I'm joined by Jamie Lewis. Uh, now, Jamie, you may well know, if you're like me, uh, from Chaos and Pain, but also, also more recently, Plague of Strength. Uh, an accomplished lifter himself as well, uh, and you know, something of a cultural historian, certainly all things strength related. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Jamie, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you for taking the time to chat. Thanks for having me. Um, so we sort of spoke briefly off air and you mentioned how far back do we want to go. So my take on that is I want to, I mean, I, I feel like a lot of people uh, nowadays think that lifting began with Arnold Schwarzenegger, Pumping Iron, nineteen sort of seventies, whenever that that exact year that that film came out. Right, but but this goes way way uh, further back than that. And then maybe people that do a bit of research get back to like a name like Eugene Sandow. However, it goes even further back than that, right? So, in terms of, and I know you're you you know you've researched this, written articles on it. How far back have you gone looking into this this whole uh, you know this whole culture? I. Uh- Amusingly, uh, I've gone back as far as six to eight thousand BC. Okay. Uh, yeah, if you go back as far as before the Aryans conquered India, the uh, the original inhabitants there was a there was a civilization they haven't really named. It's like the Indus Valley civilization, but uh, it was that and the Aryan civilization that combined to create uh, actual uh, like Indian what we know as Indian people now, and um, their system of medicine also incorporated lifting and wrestling uh and it was and the basics of yoga yoga as we know it is basically just a, a bastardized form of this sport that they do on top of a telephone pole so you have to it's a freestanding telephone pole you have to lift into place then climb it in place without it being like based in anything it's just a freestanding pole on the ground you climb it and then do yoga poses and shit on top of it oh i don't know if i'm allowed to curse on your thing i'm sorry Go for, absolutely no worries at all um six okay so that's further back than even i was thinking because i was thinking like one of the things is there's phrases like like built like a greek god or a roman statue right and so that i think shows that good physical specimens existed you know uh, pre- a long time ago pre-steroids or whatever but you've you know certainly taken things back there i mean so a, a quick i think question. i might have misspoken i think it's sixty eight thousand years ago not sixty eight thousand bc i ah. misspoke there I, I came out of, i came out of the gates goofy <laughs> no worries um thanks for clarifying that but i mean what's so my immediate question is how do you go about researching that where is this information where do you have to go to look to find this stuff uh, originally i um I went down a rabbit hole on a UK website. It was called like uh, sandow.co.uk, I think is what, do you remember that website? The Golden Age of Bodybuilding website? Yeah. And they had all of the old time strength manuals. So they had Gorner and Saxon and Hackenschmidt and everything. And so I had a job that I hated and I, every day I used to print out these books. I had binders of those books and I would just study them all the time. And there were a couple of old Indian manuals in, the, in there as well for like muscle control and things like that. And um, so I just, I was like, well, all right. So if it went back as far as the Indians, like how far, well, why don't we know this? And the Indians actually have the oldest gyms in the world. Every town had a, had a gym in India. And uh, it's because wrestling was so popular. And uh, mm-hmm. so they were big on lifting and wrestling and they all did that. And uh, so when I started to find out about that in those old Sandow books, Kind of tickled my fancy, but I didn't touch it for another maybe five years or so. And then I uh, I started reading about Indian club bells, which I always thought were just a, a goofy contrivance. I genuinely thought that the people who were using them were morons. And uh, by and large, in the modern day, they are. But the uh, <laughs> but they actually were very well used, it, like back in the day with uh, with Indians. And if you look on YouTube. Tube, you can actually see the Iron Sheik using a really heavy gata, uh, a, a club bell, uh, like in uh, like in a WWE. Uh, it was kind of some kind of stage performance, but he was showing his strength, and nobody knew how strong you had to be to do that. So James Helwig, the original or the only Ultimate Warrior, uh, came out of the crowd before he was the Ultimate Warrior, all juiced up, jacked up, couldn't even budge the thing. So it was uh, it was really cool when I saw that. I was like, all right, there's something here. So I started doing more research. I found out the Chinese have weightlifting that goes back 2,000 years. Uh, and, and they had bizarre stuff, like doing competitions with where they'd hold a stone overhead and do uh, like weighted sit-ups. I mean, just wild stuff. But people have been lifting weights as long as we've 
had the ability to compete at things, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's fascinating. And I suppose with the with the info about the reading, is there also stuff about how, uh, was, there, was there text about the mindset and how they felt it? Because, you know, it complemented both because I suppose, you know, we're, we're probably familiar with like, the Greek, Greek ideal of like sound body, sound mind and the fact that they're almost intertwined. Was that a whole part of the ethos uh, back then? Is, is that information out there? Yeah, uh, everybody up until recently took a very holistic view of health. Uh, and Ayurvedic medicine is by its very, that's the Indian, you know, the, the Indian, the ancient Indian uh, medicine and it's their lifting style. Uh, they, um, that it's, the whole thing is very comprehensive and holistic. So I, it all, it moved easily into health food stores and into hippie communes and things because it, because of its holistic nature and in the modern era especially with science the you know quote unquote science-based lifting and all that people are so they've dissected themselves into these parts and they've completely left out major segments of the human condition and uh trying to uh, trying to uh, in, like excel at all uh, maybe three or four of uh, however many you're going to give it spiritual physical intellectual Trying to excel at all of them separately is impossible. You have to do it in a holistic manner. And uh, so, yeah, it, it, it's, it appealed to me. And as a result, I just kept doing more investigations. So, I mean, in many respects, it just confirms that whole thing that nothing's really new. Uh, we're just yeah. sort of reinventing the same wheel rather than reinventing a, a new wheel in many respects. With, with so, how I got, so how I got here, actually, uh, in my research, which is... 1848 is the birth, that's the birth year of modern lifting in my mind. And I'll tell you why later. But the way I got here was I had a, a series called Nothing New Under the Sun. Because I'm sick to death of people renaming exercises and claiming that they're new. Like the crock row. Or you guys love the, I, I don't even know, you call it the seal row or whatever that is. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that, I hate that. I hate that bench. I hate everything. It's such a stupid, stupid holdover from the ancient past. And for whatever reason, people love it, but like they're acting like it's new shit, and you should buy a mm. seal row bench. And I'm like, are you are you out of your mind? Like, why would you do that? Yeah. So, uh, so, so I wanted to kind of put a stop that and stop people trying to say, oh, well, this is new, and it's like people have been doing that forever, and that's that's how I got to where I am now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's fascinating. It's interesting to know what what triggered it uh, and, and got you going there. It's funny also you talk about like the seal row bench. I feel like. We, we condense down our cycles now. So that's maybe like, uh, that'll be trendy. And then within about 15 years, it's gone and then back again. Whereas maybe before, uh, yeah, there was longer time spans between, between fads. I don't know. Like maybe, you know, maybe it's more like three months now. These fads seem to come. Yeah, go. I think with the internet, the fad cycle is probably going to be real extreme. But I still, that and a GHR machine are the two, they're my two biggest pet peeves. It's just an insane waste of money and space in the gym. So, oh, well, so we, we know we know uh, to come back to uh, you know kissing out a gym. What what needs to go in? What doesn't? We'll, uh, yeah. we'll address that separately. <laughs> um, all right. So 1848. Go on, and you've you, you dangled the carrot. I'll I'll buy it. 1848. Why uh, why is that the year of uh, sort of modern lifting? Okay, yeah. So till then, people have been lifting weights on and off. I've, I've written about how Da Vinci was a big weightlifter. So people were lifting in the Renaissance, and it was holistic then. It was sound mind, sound body, because they were looking back at the Greeks. And so by 1799, the French had kind of started a gymnastics movement, and Napoleon was using it to kick the shit out of every, like his soldiers could march further than everyone else. And so the Dutch founded the first private gym in 1799. Uh, I don't I really have any information about that gym, but it was a private gym. It, it was founded, and there it is. That's the first quote-unquote gym. Then you've got, in 1811, Friedrich Jahn, who was a German who founded the Turner Movement, which I don't know if you're familiar with. Yes, it. yes, yes. Okay, so he founded the first public gym in 1811, and it was intended specifically to train people up to stop the shit out of the French who kept coming in and stopping all the Germans. Yeah. Uh, the Germans at the time, people don't seem to know this, but uh, Germany was basically Europe's shitty backwater, just filled with assholes who just wanted to fight everybody for no reason. And, uh, that, like, that's why it wasn't even a country at the time. It was little principalities that they called the Holy Roman Empire, and it was garbage. But uh, Jan was awesome, and he was a huge, he was big on democratic ideals. He taught men and women. He was, and he 
built this system of gymnastics that actually created modern gymnastics as a sport. He invented the rings and the parallel bars and all that stuff. And so all of his followers started building bodybuilding gyms all over Europe. They it went everywhere. And they were called, usually they were called turned rinds. Uh, in the Czech Republic, they were called Sokols. But uh, the people that did it were called turners. And they used club bells, they used uh, dumbbells, uh, and they did a lot of gymnastics movements. And from that, you had the sport of heavy gymnastics come from that, which a guy, uh, Triot, started in uh, France. He invented, mo like a lot of the equipment you know of today, he had dumbbells and barbells up to 200 pounds. And the dude was jacked. He was uh, uh, 5'8 and 210, and he wasn't fat. He had a 32-inch waist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and so he was a jacked dude. Yeah. He started, he started the first group fitness classes. He started... Um, he, they think he might have had selectorized dumbbells. I bet. I mean, uh, he, just sorry to interrupt, but I bet he didn't didn't uh, envisage how group exercise was going to end up. <laughs> actually, wait, wait till you wait till you hear this. He created modern group exercise the way it ended up. Really? He, he was the weirdest dude. It, it sounds like a fairy tale, but he was a he was kidnapped by Roma when he was a baby in Spain, and uh, the, the Roma are gypsies. Uh, that's not it's a pejorative term, but I, the Roma for anybody who doesn't know. And um, so he was forced to work in the circus as a, like an acrobat. And uh, while he was being a slave for these Roma, uh, he saved a, a rich lady from a runaway horse. And uh, she, she like freed him from his bondage and sent him to this really rich school for like aristocrat kids. So he became this bizarre, like aristocratic weightlifting maven who had all these bad badass gyms. He brought music into gyms because he was from Vaudeville, so he brought music in. They started group fitness classes to music. They had galleries, so people would come in and watch people lift. So he started spectating for lifting. Like, this guy was the man, and, uh, and he's a totally unknown dude. But he, um, that was in 1847, he founded that gym. So here we are. We had the first, like, sort of modern gyms. And he had, one, he had a gym in Belgium as well specifically so that he could have chicks work out because both he and Triot were very, like they were democratic to a, like a fault and it actually ruined both of their lives. Uh, Friedrich Jan actually was forced out of teaching like pretty quick because he started his own army to fight against the French. They trashed the French and then everybody was so scared of them because they were this jacked, they were called the Fry Corps. They were this jacked bunch of maniacs who were running around like, I will not bow to a king, and they had to jail them all. So at, in 1848, a revolution started in Germany. All those people got kicked out of Germany. And they had already seen Triot stuff, and they had seen all of the Turnverein stuff. They brought it all to the U.S. And in 1848, gyms blew up in the U.S. Mm -hmm. There were no sports at this point, because until 1900 in the U.S., people only lived to be 47, and they, they worked 60 hours a week if they were lucky enough to work, work a non-farm job. Nobody had any time for that nonsense, so they didn't have time to lift. Um, but now they were, time was starting to free up. Uh, like sports papers in the U.S. began with the, the National Police Gazette, was this uh, newspaper that by 1898, it had a ton of subscribers, and they had a dedicated sports page that would just talk about boxing and lifting and vaudeville and all kinds of shit. Like all the nasty shit everybody loved. But lifting and fighting and sex and comedy were all mixed together in vaudeville. So you had all these crazy artistic intellectuals doing all this weird, weird shit. And that all went into lifting. So now you've got violent Democrats who actually, they, the Turners actually were personal bodyguards for Abraham Lincoln when he was running for president. And they, they, like, just the Turners defended St. Louis against a massive Confederate army and trashed them because they were lifters and badasses. So, um, so you, like, all of this stuff kind of combined so that by the time that you have, like, Louis Attila, or, uh, Professor Attila mm -hmm. coming on the scene, who was Eugene Sandow's coach, um, when you had him come, who also, like, taught men and women specifically and he created a lot of the modern, like, weightlifting systems that we started to see coming out. Um, and so that's really, I would call, the birthplace of lifting. Because all of those things had to come together. You had to have, now we have food to eat that isn't poison. There's water to drink that isn't poison. Nobody's going to kill us all the time. But now there's sort of some cops. Like, we're starting to get electricity. You know, you know, but still at the time, you still had to, 
if you wanted to go to the gym, you had to walk there or ride a horse. You know, and everything was fucking hard. Mm. And uh, so I love reading about these guys. And it's not like I'm looking at, I'm, I'm not one of those guys who like jerks off the pictures of golden age bodybuilders because they were natty and blah. I don't fucking care. I just respect the fact that these people had to break their asses just to get to a gym before they even started to get buff. And mm. that's why their stories are so compelling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, fascinating. I think the uh, well, that point about how things, how tough things were for them. Uh, you know, like you just mentioned like simple things that we we obviously take for granted: access to water. And if I want to eat a steak, I can just you know get it from the supermarket, cook it, eat it, job done. Right. Um, whereas, I mean, which I think is well, it's actually really powerful for anyone who's struggling right now because you think about it that basically these old school physiques, um, they're just a great example that. Uh, you know, we're looking for optimal of your training, I think that's an, a, a decent endeavor. But actually, the most important thing is hard work, consistency, uh, effort over time, and, and, and just doing that for a long time. That will take you a long way. And it, it yielded great results for these guys. And we have exactly incredible advantages over them from our starting point. So right. I think I think that's a great example um, for, for, for people there. But so quickly, there's, there's a, a loads of points there which are fascinating. I want to just try and okay. dive back sure. to. So sure. So we've got 1848, and then you mentioned, though, you know, sort of some of the things that led up to that. So, uh, for example, that first gym, uh, I believe you said, was in, in Holland, in the Netherlands, in 1799. Is that correct? Oh, it was Denmark, Denmark. Denmark. I was confused so, that too as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Denmark there. Now, it's my understanding that in the 1700s before that, you know, there was maybe the beginnings of it becoming, uh, again, more popular, but really popular with the wealthy, because you identified the fact that People basically, they didn't have time off. We didn't have leisure time. We were, uh, you were either, uh, you know, wealthy and you did, or you were everyone else and you were just working all the time. So the, right. it, there was only so many people who could do it and therefore it could only become so popular because it was reserved for those people with time as a luxury. And then the other thing I wanted to investigate a little bit is it seems to me that war would be a catalyst for physical development sort of through the ages almost because you have to prepare the people to protect the nation. Um, and, it, and it seems like, uh, that kind of happened here with Napoleon and, and his uh, troops and then the counteract, uh, you know, and what happened in Germany. And, and there was a big sense of, I suppose, maybe galvanizing, engaging interest. It seems to me they almost like appeal to the nationalistic tendencies there as well of like, you know, this is us, this is our identity. And, and as a nation, we can be strong. Is, is, is that true? Or, or is that so fun- there, the, the earliest, it's really interesting. So the earliest, um, a gymnastics movement was started in France, and uh, and as mem- if memory serves, it came from an acrobat in Spain that this guy was inspired by. Basically, all he did was just swing around on a trapeze, and it, like their gyms were disgusting. It was a nightmare before like Jan and Triac got involved, but um, but there it was like nationalistic fervor that kind of did it. Then it was nationalistic fervor uh, for Jan that kind of developed more into like a it was a, the the Turners were really about a social movement. It was about equality for all, uh, and like everybody working for like the common good. It was a very what people now would call socialist mm-hmm. uh, is what these people were. And in fact, Triot, uh, his uh, his gyms got shut down and taken from him after two of his instructors got jailed for being part of the Paris Commune, which, if you look it up, was not nearly as like red scary as as you might think but most lifting innovation most if not all lifting innovation has been driven by progressives and then eight by conservatives who are trying to match an ideal that was actually set by the people that they claim to hate it's a very strange thing but you can follow the thread from like from there all the way to early lifters because you had a split between the kind of teetotaling anti-sex Christian right people and then the the people who actually spurred the whole movement forward, which were the homosexuals, the vaudevillians, the, the musicians, the artists. And all of those golden age bodybuilders everybody thinks were straight as arrows. Steve Reeves used to go on the regular to Scotty Bauer's uh, like gas station in LA, which was a place that everybody went to bang. Dude, Rock Hudson went there to bang. Everybody went there to, to bang. But like Betty White used to go like run trains in that place. It was crazy. But Steve Reeves was definitely in there getting the dick. <laughs> and, and 
all of those guys who were in those competitions alongside Steve Reeves were managed by a guy named Bob Menzer, who was, uh, he used those guys in a gay for pay situation where he would basically pimp them out to producers and directors, get pictures of them fucking dudes, and then be like, we're going to go ahead and give these to your wife unless you let our actors act in your stuff. And so that got all those muscular dudes into Hollywood, basically through blackmail. So then you, and that drove more interest in lifting. So um, the names aren't coming to, to me off the top of my head, but I mean, you had all the uh, Tarzan guys. You had, yeah. you had Jack dudes here and there. Charles Bronson was always ripped to shreds. Like, and all of that, like people seeing that in the, uh, in the movies and stuff, all led to more lifting. So it's kind of one feeds the other side. Like one side's looking at, trying to be an a, a mythical ideal and the other side is just trying to like express themselves and mm -hmm. somehow they inter they interconnect it's yes. just made jim's uncomfortable to be in in the u.s recently <laughs> with politics but i don't know how it is over there but jesus it's not it's become less fun to go to the gym for yeah second. yeah yeah so it's it's you're so right that the uh on, on so many levels they oppose each other so much, but at the same time have, have similar interests. But I suppose is that part of like muscular Christianity, for example, I know, I know this is something you know a lot about because uh, you, you told me uh, on, on email yes. about the really exciting uh, think, uh, projects that you were part of there. But as far as my understanding of that is that's like almost building your body to be like closer to God. And it's, they are all about sort of restraint doing, um, you know, your, your body is a gift from God and you should treat it as such. And therefore, nothing unpure type thing that that's my you know limited knowledge of it um is is that was well, that roughly fair well that's a very happy sugar coating of what essentially boils down to black dudes are gonna fuck all our women if we don't get buff right there you go oh. yeah it, it was and it was so uh there was a lot of weirdness in the U.S. with race, like around that around the time of the 1850, because you had the Civil War coming on. Yeah. And so certain states were really loosening restrictions on race, and certain ones were really clamping them down. And then you had the Civil War, and then everybody was so polarized after that that there was a 10-year period where everything was rad for black people. So you actually had like black people playing professional baseball, and you never hear about that, and like pro-black boxers and things like that. And then they all got kicked, and women doing mm -hmm. shit women mm -hmm. becoming mayors and women like so women had all this freedom and then about 10 years after the uh, civil war ended all the people on the right were like oh all these people are being assholes and we're losing our white rights and so they like went back to being shit bags but uh <laughs> it, but, but they still but they still so they used lifting in an in an effort to show their supremacy and they used boxing in a lot of ways to show their supremacy mm -hmm. okay. and uh at like the YMCA, YMCA got started uh, in Massachusetts uh, specifically to oppose the Turners, right? And they wanted to keep the keep the white young men from turning to evil vices like drinking and get you know anything that would involve music and like fucking anything that would be fun. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say anything that's and, fun, and also anything that would be manly, you know, quote unquote manly. Right. Okay. Interesting. Uh, I'd, I didn't hadn't. Uh, I suppose Wikipedia doesn't give you those kind of details, right? <laughs> right. Um, and so, at, at this stage, so if we so we take it back to you know that time, eighteen forty eight, and, and there or thereabouts, when it's starting to become popular. All right. So we know now that within the fitness industry, we're full of tribes, and you're all like you're you're on your team, and anyone who's not as a you know, dick, and they can't do anything right. Everything you do is perfect. I imagine back then, well, number one, they didn't have the internet, which is in many ways a blessing. But um, yes. because of that, if you're doing something, there's only like so far your your sphere of influence can 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 sort of spread. Uh, exactly. Because, you know, it's word of mouth and people, you mm -hmm. know, also we didn't have, you know, car, cars that people could drive across country in or planes or anything like that. So what I'm sort of getting at is, did they all almost do very similar stuff in their own little satellite locations? Or was there like these people over here are doing something crazy, completely different, and and these, or was it they're all doing roughly the same stuff? They just don't know it because they've never interacted with each other. Well, that's where you're wrong. Uh, this is uh, I I am just the supreme nerd. So uh, <laughs> good. So I've been, 
I've, I've been writing a lot about this guy, Colonel Thomas Royer Monstry, who is basically like he is the most interesting man who has ever lived. Uh, he was he was a sword. I'm not going to go into it, but he's a swordsman. He was like a dueler, but he also uh, taught people how to how to sword fight and fist fight and uh, lift. Mm. And he taught these. He, he taught all the female, like the first action stars in the world, were in vaudeville, and they were chicks. Uh, one of them was Lola Montez, who Volbeat wrote a song about. She was trained by Monstry. And then the other one was uh, was Ada Menken, who became this huge chick on vaudeville. But both of them were badasses. They could fist fight men and win. They were hot as shit, and they were jacked. And their lifting coach, well, at least Ada Menken's lifting coach under uh, Monstry, was a strongman and wrestler from Australia. You might know uh, William Miller. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. No, I haven't. He was... Miller competed against all the wrestlers and strongmen of the time and did pretty well against them. He wrestled Hackenschmidt and he wrestled Gorner. I think he probably, he might have beat some of them. I know he wrestled Gama as well. Like he was a bad, he was a genuine badass and he was jacked. So he actually, so he goes from Australia to New York City and then from New York City took the train to San Francisco, which would just become a city. Like basically didn't exist. But so you have training techniques coming from Australia, and he was definitely in France and, and in England, then New York. Then, I mean, it's everything is, is going all over the world at this point. Mm-hmm. As soon as they had the ability to take the train and to sail, like, sail fairly quickly, I think this stuff really started transmitting quickly. Yeah, okay. Plus, uh, people who are good at things are always looking for ways to be better at them. And, and you know, this is something where if you're going to travel and compete, you're going to tra- try to figure out how these other people train and how they eat and all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that really uh, accelerated the transfer of knowledge uh, at yep. you know, that, that time. Interesting. And, and uh, I suppose, well, you know, uh, and the, vaude- the vaudeville circuit in the U S I, I don't know if you're familiar with vaudeville. It was basically like YouTube before YouTube, before the internet. So people would go to a theater and the, the streets would be lined with these theaters and they would put on shows. It would be a comedy. It would be like, First, there'd be a comedian, then there'd be some music, then there'd be a lifter, then there'd be fighters, and they they have all kinds of shit. And uh, <clears throat> so, uh, these people would travel all over the country and make shit loads of money. Like uh, Ada Menken was the richest person in America when she died. She was the richest human being, and she was also half black. She was a half black and a chick and the richest person in America. Like that's pimped, and it was <laughs> due to lifting weights. There's a life lesson for us all there. Like, exactly. <laughs> um, so, actually, so it's a good point you make. Like, they're part of these shows. I mean, at this stage, like, sort of lifting its, its entertainment, its curiosity for people, just these incredibly strong, impressive displays, uh, displays of strength. And when did it start becoming competitive uh, more, more so? Because it seemed, my, my understanding is, you know, it's, there was an element of competition there uh, and, and show, you know, what people... Compete, but it wasn't not quite the same way as we think of maybe competition now, especially we've got we've got sports. I mean, there's so much organized competition. Back then it was almost for the the appeal of just the wow factor as opposed to what can I do that beats you. Yeah, I, a lot there were a lot of personal challenges and things like that that went on and on the vaudeville circuit, like that happened a lot. People would be ringers in the crowds and things. But uh the first Britain had the first bodybuilding and first weightlifting competition in the same decade. I, th- I think it was the last decade of, like, of the 1800s. I'm reasonably certain. I'm not, I think it was 1898 and 1891, uh, but don't quote me on that. But the, um, the Sandow's Grand Exhibition was a really big deal because uh, it was the first like national bodybuilding competition. He, like, he combed the countryside and advertised really heavily to get the best physiques so that he, to choose from. And then the uh, the one in the U.S. had the biggest prize in a bodybuilding competition, un- like you know, adjusted for current dollars, until I I think the early '90s or something. I mean, it was like oh, wow. it was five grand in like 1901 or something like that, and uh, it sold out Madison Square Garden. And then they had a riot outside because people wanted to get in. Like it was wild, and they had chick bodybuilders in. So, and then muscular Christianity came in and was like, chicks can't do this, black people can't do this, this person. Because apparently those people think that by making people not compete, then they win, which is, mm. to me, not winning. But. No. <laughs> yeah, there's an interesting take on it, isn't it? Um, yeah. Actually, so, again, interesting. So there was, you know, women being involved in this, um, much more, I mean, so, so than I, I think, well, 
we would imagine now, and certainly over the last few decades, it seems that was more accepted. But then was it was that like genuine equality or was it a case of so think of Sandow, for example. I mean, he was worshipped, right? This is the ideal. Were the women involved lifting then also sort of put on that pedestal and something to be aspired to? Or was it more of a freak show? Uh, that depends on who you ask. I mean, so you had very, very disparate views, especially in the U.S. I don't, I don't know about Britain because I'm not British. But uh, the, the views of people in the U.S. really swung wildly between... Uh, between what we think of as right and left, like they turned it and flipped it. So you had all of the suffragettes who all did jujitsu in Britain and they're all bad. I, I don't know if you know that, but uh, yeah, like all of the chicks who were trying to get the vote would fuck people up on the street if they said anything unkind. And so you had these chicks who were extremely liberated in every way that you could possibly imagine working against their own interests with the muscular Christianity movement because they didn't want their husbands to drink. And, you know, it was it was a really interesting mix of stuff. But most people looked down on the women who lifted because of vaudeville, because you had prostitution and you had uh, like burlesque acts and stuff like that. And a lot of the muscular acts were I don't remember the the woman's name off the top of my head, but she was the biggest draw in vaudeville in the U.S. for a long time, and uh, she could do thirty-seven one-arm chins. Her biceps were insane, and she used to do a strip tease in the middle of her act, like while hanging, like she would do it from a rope, and wow. she would just she would just strip, and then like people would go bananas, and she was the biggest draw. But like people would just keep saying, "Oh, well, she's Jack, she's a whore," but she also didn't drink, didn't smoke, didn't eat meat. Like she had all these different, so it was it was really interesting, be, uh, like how all that worked. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, interesting. I wonder how much of it is in terms of the criticism comes from like men that are insecure because they they're like, well, look look at this physical uh, specimen. You know, I, I can't do that. So somehow we need to we need to find a way to control that and make it seem unappealing. And 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 yeah, I wonder if well, if that was at play. Oh, you can see it in the writing because some of the guys who describe these women, it, it's exactly like the YouTube. You know, you look like a man nonsense. You see when like. Steffi Cohen, who weighs, what, 120 pounds? And they're like, oh, she's a lumbering behemoth of steroids. And so she's 120 pounds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and adorable. <laughs> but they would do the same thing about uh, people like Lucita Lears, who was uh, an acrobat who had, like, I think 15-inch arms. She was just all biceps. It was awesome. But uh, yeah, there were some there were some really buff chicks in vaudeville, but you just don't hear about them because nobody knows what vaudeville yeah okay interesting uh you talked about those shows that those first shows and the one with uh with you know five thousand dollars of the prize money back then am i right in thinking that those kind of bodybuilding shows they almost also had a performance element or, or like a strength element so you would uh it was you know physique but also you know there was some lifting involved or was it just straight bodybuilding uh, well bodybuilding had to evolve as well when they first started out all the guys were just emulating greek statues mm. so they were doing the poses they saw in greek statues and um, it took time for, like, muscle control. And I, I don't know if you've ever researched that, but it's, like, just basically, uh, like, isometric contractions. It took a while for all that to get into bodybuilding and where people would put on a show with their muscles. Um, and weightlifting and bodybuilding were, at that point, I'm pretty sure, separate. I mean, they might have there might have been some aspect of, well, he looks better than you do kind of thing. But uh, weightlifting didn't even have weight classes at that point. So it was really personal challenges like i think you are a dog shit and i'm gonna outlift you kind of thing and then they would choose random lifts like oh, i want the one-handed snatch and then the other person would pick uh, the two-handed snatch or uh, in a, a signboard squat or something you know and they would just go back and forth on those which i think is an amazing way to test strength mm -hmm. yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah when bodybuilding first started like a, uh in an organized fashion like in the late 30s it was part of weightlifting because in the U.S., the AAU just kind of attacked. They were like, "Ah, oh, well, it's lifting. Just put it in there." So you did the lifting first, then you posed down after. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. So you you had to be able to do the lifting before you even got your shot at displaying your physique type thing. You had to. Yeah, you, uh, yeah, you, you had to. You had to demonstrate your strength before you were even allowed in a bodybuilding competition. Yeah. So you had to go in and like, uh, there there are uh, stories about like uh, Armand Tanny and uh, I think it was. 
just doing some kind of, he did a 225 pound snatch in a full suit without warming up or something. And they were like, all right, you can enter. So, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a reasonable standard to work wise. I think fair, fair play, fair play on that. Yeah, one. yeah, yeah. Um, if you can do that in a suit and wing tips, and not rip your suit, I don't even understand yeah. how that can happen. <laughs> yes. Now with the stretchy, now with those stretchy suits, I mean, you get in there and get a full workout in in a suit. But uh, yeah, the real key yeah. here is we want to know the secrets of his tailor. But um, the uh, <laughs> so, so we got S- Sandow with obviously name checked a couple of times here, and I mean, incredible businessman. I talk about someone m- making lots of money like and, and knowing how to market to people uh he was obviously an expert at that but you also talked about that whole looking like greek gods or roman statues or whatever um i, I heard someone say that you know because that whole muscular christianity the idea of this guy with like basically naked in front like women stroking his abs or whatever muscular christianity you know and and, and anything like remotely conservative like that wouldn't wouldn't want it but he kind of got away with it because he was almost like I think painted himself to look like a statue. So, you know, it's almost appealing to their, uh, their, their idea of ego and uh, knowledge and, um, and being well read of, Oh, we know what the Greeks did for us, for example. Oh, this is okay. Right. Because you look, you look like one of those statues or a Greek God or, or whatever. And he kind of was, well, that was a male prostitute for a while. So I don't think he was, t- I don't think he was trying to, end- do anything Jesus-y. I think he was just trying no, to make no, that so, money. No, no, so he's, <laughs> he's not. Like, he's, oh, okay. my understanding, he's full-on, like, chasing the money and, and very smart with it. But but there was a lot, like, the way you got, one, I'm thinking about how he wasn't just shot down, like, you can't do this. And one of the, like, what was it because he portrayed it as being this art form of worship, you know, harking back to the... Oh, no, it's at that, well, at that point, the, the late 19th century is when the whole conception of gay even happened. Uh, the late 19th century. I don't know the date but off the top of my head, but you can look up look it up on PubMed. But that's where I learned about it. Uh, but um, but so there wasn't even a conception of that. But there was a lot of gay stuff going on, like because at that point everybody fucked everybody. It wasn't there was no conception of gay because dudes didn't fuck dudes. It was nobody cared. There, like Leonardo da Vinci got accused of sodomy at least once. It like legally accused of sodomy. Uh, so, like, uh, all these guys were fucking each other, but it's, I think as that conception of homosexuality became more ingrained in our psyche from uh, psychologists, and it came from psychologists rather than Christianity, which is interesting, uh, The um, I think that kind of seeped into the thinking for bodybuilding. So I know in the Mr. America was... 41-ish or something, or 42, somewhere around in the early 40s, they actually made them stop using oil for posing. So you'll see, uh, like, Steve Reeves is in it, uh, Eric Peterson is in it. They both look real flat. Mm. And it's not because they didn't have full muscle bellies. It's just because they weren't allowed to oil up and because it was too gay. And they were they had to take the music out of their posing. I mean, it was really, it was really ridiculous. But they, there was very specific rules, and it was specifically because they said, it's just too gay. You're just being too too gay. <laughs> Standing up there in your like trunks, that's okay. But this is this is too far having oil. Yeah, and, and us ogling you. That's yeah, exactly. That's, yeah, that's totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, you, you mentioned uh, Professor Attila earlier on, uh, right. and, like, and he's like Sans, you know, certainly was Sans, some period of time was like Sandow's co- coach, right? Yes, he was. He uh, Sandow when he came to the U.S. was broke and. Uh, Attila let him become the janitor in the gym so that he could train there. So he just cleaned up around the gym and then Attila just helped him with his training. And uh, that's where Sandow really got like super duper. I mean, he was already strong, but that's where he, that's where he developed the physique where we recognize. Yes. So it sort of showcases that when you've got, you know, a coach who knows what they're doing and that effort come together, that the, there's, there's, you know, results, untapped results there for the taking. And so I'm, I'm, I think I'm right in thinking like Professor Attila, he was like very scientific with his approach to uh, the, the whole process. And, you know, both yeah, he, he had done a lot of modern equipment. Um, his gym in New York was, uh, it was one of the first non-Turner public gyms that I could find that allowed both men and women to train there. Um, and he had, like they were doing sets and reps like he had a very specific way to train that he had developed and it that's what he actually put out a challenge to anyone in the country that he would give them a thousand dollars in 1900 money like god only even knows i think it's like 32 grand now or something right, okay. if anybody could definitively prove their 
system of training was not influenced in some way by his. Nice. And he never paid a thousand dollars. I like that confidence. So, yeah, yeah, and well, and he was just a bad man. He was a jack dude who knew what he was doing. So uh, that was that's really cool. And I think that is if I if I have a mission in my in the way that I'm teaching my history beyond just trying to teach people general history by using lifting as a hook, it's uh, to teach people that you you got to stop looking at, like you got to stop being unable to see the forest for the trees. Like yeah, Sandow was cool and. Warner was cool, and you know, but the world would have progressed just fine without them. Lifting would be unchanged. We would just like a different lift. Those people weren't the important people. So I'm trying to shed a light on the the ones who actually did the stuff that made us who we are today. Yeah, so I think that's that's an interesting point. So because I imagine that really Sandow didn't really create anything, but he was the face that popularized it. Perhaps is exactly okay. Exactly. Yeah, it, I mean, it's like the difference between. A, a person, I, I can't think of a person off the top of my head who invented a thing and then was a spokesperson. But like, uh, you know, it's the difference between the, being the inventor and being the spokesperson. Yeah. The spokesperson might know a lot about it, but he still wasn't the guy who came up with all. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. yeah, fascinating. <laughs> uh, actually, with that, what I mean, was Sandow? I mean, obviously, incredible physique, and and had the influence of Attila. But in terms of him. Sort of, yeah, because he is. I mean, well, the 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 trophy you win is the Sandow, right? Like he's yeah. in, in in that respect, we we kind of all think like the, the godfather of modern bodybuilding in in, in that way. Um, was was he really also helped by you know t- timing? So, for example, my my technological knowledge isn't that good, but I imagine around about that times when like photography started to become a thing. So you could now get his image all over the world, whereas there have been guys twenty years earlier in for example, credible physiques, but no one would ever see it because we didn't have a way to photograph it and show it. To right. Them. However, Al, uh, Al Trialar is the one who should be getting all the credit for really spreading bodybuilding because when you see that at the beginning of Pumping Iron, that old-timey video, everybody thinks that's Eugene Sandow. It's not. It's Al Trialar. He was a vaudevillian, and uh, he was a bodybuilder, and he, I, he might have won that first bodybuilding exhibition in the U.S., um, but I think he did win it. Uh, but in any event, he was, he was the one that, you know, so he was the image that you were seeing that you, you just thought it was a sand out. Yeah. We just basically, and I suffered from this as well up until in the last two years, there wasn't, you could only get the information. Like you were saying earlier, you could only get the, avail- the information that was available to you. So we just kept telling the story that we knew and it wasn't the true story. You know, it wasn't the whole story. So I, I don't want anybody to think that I like I'm uncovering secrets. It's just that uh, it's uh, there's more to the story than than we think. Yeah, yeah, we haven't dug deep enough before. There was just yeah un- untapped resources in terms of, of right. information here. Yeah, um, that's what, and the other thing with, with send out that time, I imagine again that's when like you know printing's in, techniques have improved and or whatever, and they can get you know because there will start to be magazines like physical culture magazines. Um, mm-hmm. I forget the, the, you know, the, the let's not like muscle and strength, but it's it's not that dissimilar, right? But anyway, um, there's yeah, they had, well, uh, I think Weeder started strength and health in 1943 or something like that. But yeah, they, and Bernard McFadden, the guy who put on the original uh, the original bodybuilding competition in the U.S., he was the he was the Joe Weeder before Joe Weeder. We just yeah. he was also the Jack Lane before Jack Lane. He was the guy who started all those stupid birthday challenges and dragging people in rowboats and nonsense. That was all Bernard McFadden was also a sex freak and he was a, like lived with multiple girls and like so that's also where a lot of the muscular christianity was fighting they was okay. aping it but fighting it at the same time because they're like well the sex is bad but the other stuff is kind of <laughs> good i guess you know what i mean <laughs> the, yeah they would just pick, pick what they like out of it um exactly yeah interesting yes yeah, so, so i imagine therefore also he's got you know magazines they 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 get out to people again just spreading the word and, and send out yeah there. Right time, right place, with an impressive physique, obviously. Yeah, and uh, the National Police Gazette really played into that. And like you said, the technology of having um, having that crappy paper, that pulp paper, that's mm-hmm. what made that information able to be spread around. So uh, it's really, like you just said, it's it's so cool that like it took the industrialization of uh, food and uh, you know, the establishment of legitimate government that actually works for the people to, like, sanitize water and build roadways. 
That's the reason why we have the physiques we have. It's yeah. not because we're better than the people from the past. It's just we have all the advantages that they don't. Yeah, yeah the odds are yeah. stacked in our favour now. Um, yeah, brilliant. Um, oh, so, yes, that was, uh, again, we were talking, it popped in my head. Um, that we've got, like, you talked about him, like, sex free, but, like, a, the, the person organising it behind the scenes. It seems quite often there's, like, this mad genius behind the scenes who's got the big vision and they have their star. So, like, maybe maybe that's an unfair description of Attila being a mad genius. But anyway, it's, it's, he, he's, like, this great brain, but he, and he has his, his little starlet. And then, I suppose, um, Hoffman with Grimek, right? Or yeah. uh, with, uh, Joe uh, we with, are, with uh, Schwarzenegger. Schwarzenegger, exactly. And they, that kind of, this person who realises, I can use this person, and, I mean, they get benefits, and I get benefits, and it's like this this uh, symbiotic relationship they, they elevate themselves and, and make, right. make a lot of money but it it does seem like over the year i don't know who currently that is but over the years there's these these people the real the person with the influence and they they anoint their uh their, their you know their their prince or whatever and push them forward. right and, the, and the, another wild thing about uh kind of what you were just talking about is the fact that uh, when you said that people think the bodybuilding started in the 1970s that's because that's when Weeder really started to push all of his competition out. Mm -hmm. So before 1980, nobody cared about the Mr. Olympia. Nobody cared. Literally nobody cared at all. In fact, it was added on as originally, like, it, it was the, the original IFBB Mr. Universe was tacked on to the Miss Universe. It was a male beauty pageant. Nobody cared at all. And so... Uh, there was the NABA Mr. Universe. NABA was the big deal before, and that's UK based, so I'm sure you're more yeah. familiar with it than my readers are. But um, that's where Bill Parole came from. And so there were a ton of really cool lifters in the 70s. Nobody in the US knows about because all we know is what Weeder told us. You know what I mean? So I've been trying to dig those people up too because the, there was NABA, there was uh, uh, the WBBF, uh, I think that was Dan Lurie's uh, federation. And Dan Lurie was another cool, weird little influencer who nobody knows about. But yeah, yeah. But we didn't control the narrative, so it was all uh, all the stuff that that you know he he wanted people to to, to hear about, I suppose. Right. And we or Dan Lurie kind of gave us the uh, the idea that it should be the most jacked person in the competition that should win it, rather than the person who is the prettiest and the tallest and has read the most books, or it doesn't have a lisp, or isn't black, or whatever the Mr. America was doing. And um, so that's kind of cool. Like the, and also, the idea of mass monsters comes from very small guys competing in bodybuilding. Okay. They were always the most jacked and the most ripped, like Dan Lurie, but they couldn't win because they were standing up against people who outweighed them by 100 pounds. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, so I suppose I just want to bring this like bring this really up to date. Sure. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. Like, well, no, because I think you know, there's people listening, and like it's been fascinating all that you know so much stuff that even people that think they know about the history would be like well i had no idea there um but then so we look at where we're at now and i made the joke about you know having the internet maybe that was a blessing but but with the instagram culture um and then the influence that that has and and people's belief that they have to look shredded jacked 24 7 3 6 5 um i think i mean like it creates incredible pressure probably a lot of um, mental anguish or certainly issues um, and also prevents them from reaching their potential because people are just too scared to gain any fat now because we're, we're so worried about how we're going to be judged on our Instagram post. And, and we feel that we have to make that Instagram post, right? God forbid you just go and train. You, you, you know, you've got to be filming. I, I will tell you this. I mock you people with your accountability posts. I mock you morning, noon, and night. I laugh at people for filming themselves in the gym. Because nobody gives a fuck, first off. You're not filming anything interesting, second off. And if you are performing rather than lifting, you're not fucking getting the work done. Because you're never going to let yourself fail. You're never going to test yourself. And you're always thinking about the goddamn camera. Yeah, I, I think that is the... Uh, it's Instagram lifters are a joke. Yep, yeah. I think that's All they the, do is the gas guy. up. They gas up like crazy. Then they burn out and disappear. Because... They, one, they weren't real lifters in the first place, and two, they weren't there for the lifting. Yeah. So you, you I using think, some fake plates along the ride too, probably. But ah, uh... uh, you know, and I, 
I laughed about fake plates when people first started saying it about uh, the one chick who was squatting all the weight and uh, Brad Castleberry. And uh, then I came to find out that we were actually fake plates. And I still maintain, where are they getting fake plates? And why would you go to that those lengths? It's just, it's, and, but it, and why would you feed the trolls? <laughs> Not, none of it really makes any sense. But no, it, it doesn't. It but, doesn't. I mean, but we're living in a world where people um, go onto YouTube to watch other people play computer games. So, uh, no, of course, none of it makes any sense. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I, uh, you know, I, there are so many revenue streams. I'm like, you disgust me. There's no way that I'm going to do that. <laughs> um, all right, Jamie, it's been brilliant. I've, I've really loved this. It's uh, been fascinating. We're sort of closing up on time, so I want to keep you too much longer. But I suppose, I mean, I don't know, is there, we've got all this fascinating information about how people used to train, how this predates us by centuries and thousands of years. And we know that, you know, training to be stronger, more jacked and harder to kill is, you know, beneficial and and, and also like a, a holistic approach to this. You know, it's it, you need to, to do all of those elements. For people that maybe are getting sucked down the rabbit hole of the Instagram lifting. Do you have a message for people? What, what should they be looking to get out of their training? I'll start with everything isn't for everybody. So if you don't like lifting, find some other way to stay fit. And I'm not saying that to be a, a gatekeeper. I'm saying that like, it's a hobby. It's not work. You should never, I don't ever want to hear about a grind. It's not a grind. You're going into the gym to have fun. That's the point of it. The point is to have fun. The reason why I'm 44 and look better than I've ever looked in my entire life is because I love the lift. I mean, I have to sometimes when I when I think about when I think that I have to go to the gym, I will make myself stay home mm. because once it starts to become a compulsion, it stops being fun. And when you when it stops being fun, you don't work as hard. Mm -hmm. And so, find a way to lift that makes you enjoy it, that makes you love going to the gym. Because for me, every time I go into the gym, I have a ball. I play loud music. I scream along with it. I'm jumping around. I'm having a good time. And I used to be real caught up. And here's my last bit of advice. Stop getting so caught up in like taking yourself seriously. This isn't serious. Lifting's not serious. Life isn't that serious. And we have it as easy as human beings could have it. So just go into the gym, fall out, have fun. Don't lift for the gram. When you do film, film something for the gram, make it film worthy. You know what I mean? Like, have fun with it. And we don't want to watch a 45-second fucking setup for deadlifts. Oh, God. If I had a gun and one bullet, it would be used on any person who, or on their setup. Just walk up and shoot them and put them out of our misery. <laughs> oh, I used make... to mock Dan Green to his face at meets about that. i make sure I'm going to do a deadlift setup video just for you now. Um, <laughs> all right. So, I mean, I think some excellent advice. I really like that. Actually, because uh, the one thing I'd add to that is you can learn to love something. You don't necessarily have a, a great aptitude for at first. If your driver is there, for, for example, for me, I was I always preferred like, you know, uh, endurance activities. I was always skinny, but I, I didn't want to be so skinny. So I got into lifting and then I, you know, I actually love the process and the results that came with it. And as you're right now, now I, 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 I train and I look forward to training. It's not it's not a punishment. It's not. A, I'm not enduring this. This is like this is the best part of my day. Yeah, uh, kind of thing. So exactly. If you could. And, and by the way, like, how did you arrive at how you train? Because I think that's important. Because people should play to their strengths. You know, the, like the people who pick a martial art based on which one's cool, as opposed to like, well, that's you know a northern Chinese style. It's for tall people, and I'm three feet tall. Maybe I should find a different style. Nobody ever does that. They just they're like, oh, that's cool, or oh, that's trendy. Look at the different things. See what fits you. So what fits you? What training style fits you? Yeah, I'm so, sure it's not what fits me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think actually that's like, if you take it back, like, well, first of all, the reason I started training was I was a really good rugby player, but I was too small. And like, I was good enough to be a professional, but they were like, you're not, your contract's not going to get renewed if you don't get bigger. And then unfortunately, what did I do? I sought out the biggest bloke to get me, uh, to, to teach me how to train. Unfortunately, he was a five foot nine bodybuilder. I'm six foot three. Um, <laughs> that, and as we, I, I learned that doesn't work. And then I suppose it's just been a, 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 a progressive, long-term trial and error. Um, use these principles. How do they apply? Adjust them. Uh, you know, and an iter iterative process. Like you, you refine what's worked for you. Um, and now what I like is, well, I've got two kids. You know, I've got, I've got, I've got a, a job to do. I like training four days a week and I train hard four days a week. And then I put my feet up the other three days. In the past, I would have felt like a day out of the gym. Couldn't do it. You know, I'd have felt like... Right. You had to be there. 
again, probably at that stage in my life, that's what needed to happen for me to learn that it wasn't. And yeah, any all sorts of other other approaches. Um, I, I quite like training volume because I quite like leaving with a pump at the end, right? So I'll, I'll yeah. balance my training. Because you want to look good when you leave the gym. Yeah, even if it's only for about 11 minutes afterwards. But exactly. Like those, those great rest 11 minutes of the day, I'll take that. So exactly. So uh, for me, you know, I'm, I'm usually, I'm, I'm hardly ever south of six reps. I'm mo- almost exclusive in six to 15 reps. And sometimes I make myself do the stuff outside of that that I really don't want to. But, uh, but every now and again, I feel good for the challenge. All the, all the 70s bodybuilders were big on, uh, like, high rep calves. And I have big calves anyway, but I try to – I hate – sets of 50 on calves. Like, my God, that is just torture. But it works. <laughs> but but, but uh, random calf training thing, but, like, nothing burns like your calves when you – in my experience, like, they're the most painful muscle group. If you take them to a point of, like, failure – I mean, I have there's, – there's a rumor I have some calves down here, but no one's seen them. <laughs> but – but like they're the most painful things that as as a muscle, like nothing hurts like training calves. It's because you can't. There's no way to rest them at all. Even when you're laying down, there's still either flexing or stretching. So it's just uh, there's no there's no way for them to just just calm themselves completely. <laughs> I agree. Painful, painful. painful. All right, Jamie. We are almost up on time. I just want to uh, take a little bit more of your time if I can. Sure. Next question from me is: Tell me something about yourself that people probably don't know. This, this question always gets people to have a little think. I have to fill for time by sort of saying that, stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. But is there anything out there like we wouldn't, you know, if they follow your blog, they don't already know? Yes. I, in fact, I will, I will share a bit with you that I, that I, I don't even write about. I don't write about myself much. I, I, I don't see the reason. But um, going back to the not taking yourself too seriously thing, I've, I've been trying to do that so much more recently and also just kind of make myself a bit more vulnerable i suppose i had gotten very asocial and so i've been more social and uh so i actually discovered that i love the movie trolls 2 uh which is i think trolls 2 is so positive for the world i think it could save the world literally but if people just absorb the message that's contained in it because uh for anybody who's not seen it, it's uh, it's about the hard rock trolls. The metal trolls are trying to take over all of music and destroy all shitty music. And uh, and it's a fun allegory for life. And I think that it's uh, it it really kind of drove home that the point that I was kind of on the right path of not taking myself so seriously. So uh, that movie, and, and also I just saw the Mitchells versus the Robots or whatever that is. On, yes, on Netflix, yes, I that, I which is my son. very oh, uh, they do. Yeah, it was fantastic, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I watched Trolls Two with my daughter. Like they, 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 they're not really sort of on the same page themselves. There, like okay, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Those two movies go well together, though. Like in terms of tone and, and yeah. So yeah, I my my life is now a weird mishmash of like saccharine shit because I always loved Happy Hardcore back in the day, all that terrible squeaky voiced, super fast EDM stuff. Um, so now I've just gotten back in more into that, which has just made me even weirder, and I'm having a good time with it. So. <laughs> well, but Jamie, I never expected you to come out and confess that you're a Trolls 2 fan. And <laughs> <laughs> that, I, think, I think that's worth the interview alone, but I can vouch for the quality of that movie and the general sort of uh, feel-good factor and uh, it wouldn't the world be a better place type scenario that comes afterwards. Um, and and, and that's, that's actually one my son's like, it's one of these ones he'll he'll kind of watch, but he's not watching. You know what I mean? Like, uh, he doesn't want to... If, if, the, if, the, if the lifting world could could watch that movie en masse and we could get all the right-wing goofs to watch it and understand it, can you imagine how nice the lifting world would be? You know, people would just go back to the 70s thing of like, Oh, we're all just here to lift. Let's all yeah. just like compete in random stuff and have fun and look jacked. And uh, it would be nice to get back to that because I miss those days. Yeah, that would be a whole lot better. Uh, final question from me is, if I could interview anyone, I've got an address book with everyone's contacts in it. Who should I interview next? Ooh. Have you interviewed Chris Duffin yet? I have not. I know I know, I know. know of Chris Duffin. I've seen uh, his on Elite FTS uh, articles and uh, you know, I've seen his, his Instagram as well. So... No he's the guy who invented the kabuki bar and uh he's also a crazy good power lifter but he's about the only strength coach that i interact with or uh, i'll say that with whom i interact that's he is literally the only strength coach i like so okay all right i'll definitely I mean, get uh, luke, luke, luke davies is a nice guy i don't know him all that much but uh 
Okay. I didn't just just throw in my UK plug. I, yeah, I do like Luke Davies as well. <laughs> All right, I'll I don't know if he coaches them. I'll get, uh, I'll, I'll get in touch with those to try and get on the show. Yeah, Chris, Chris Duffin's a good shout, actually. He's, uh, he's got some interesting stuff. And, uh, yeah, like, and, well, some, some really good, uh, good bars and, and things uh, from what I've seen. Oh, so. yeah. He, he's a really genuinely good guy and wildly intelligent. So, right. yeah. All right. Good, good. Sounds like a perfect guest. All right, Jamie, uh, thanks again for taking the time. Uh, please... Absolutely. This was a lot of fun. Uh, great. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, let, let everyone know where they can find out a little bit more about you if they want to dig deeper into this, do some more research, read your articles, uh, all that sort of thing. Uh, please plug yourself. Uh, sure. I, my website's plagueofstrength.com, and it's spelled exactly like it sounds. <laughs> and uh, that's where you can get all the wacky history that I, uh, I read about. And I also have uh, – I've got nutri- – I read about the history of strength training and martial arts, and I also combine that with nutrition. Uh, I do a lot of cooking and share recipes and things like that. Uh, I'm also on Instagram as Plague of Strength, and I'm on uh, Wick, or on uh, Facebook as Jamie Lewis uh, or Jamie Chaos. Okay. So, yeah, uh, Instagram is probably the best way to get me, unless they just want to message back and forth. In which case, Facebook. So, okay. I uh, yeah, my Gmail is a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I'll make sure all the show notes uh, have have those links in there for people to go check out. Also, just thanks. Uh, plug uh, Chaos and Pain uh, is still up and about, right? Like the the I, the the old articles are there as well. I, I, so I had a, I, I've had some legal issues oh, with my, okay. with my former business partner oh. and uh, I saw the wheels coming off the business partnership and I had formed a supplement company out of the original website uh, just to build off the brand name. And uh, then I realized I hated the supplements the way my partner had taken them. So I just rebranded myself. The, uh, the the old uh, blog spot isn't isn't up. It just redirects ah, okay. back to the Plague of Strength. So okay, right, if so they do go to Chaos and Pain, it'll take them right to Plague of Strength. Okay, so you can get access to the old articles. Uh, and yeah, yeah, they're all up, they're all up on Plague of Strength, and uh, okay. it's easy to search now. The website is much much better archived. So okay, interesting. So yeah. I didn't I, I didn't know the behind the scenes ramifications. I just thought Plague of Strength. You decided you wanted a a new a new spin on things. So yeah, well, I, I, the the thing was when I was. Uh, Doing the chaos and pain thing, I was not able to write everything I wanted to write because of you know all the legal issues that go with supplementation and things. Plus, I was uh, dating a a girl who inexplicably was in porn but didn't like me putting porn into my blogs, which I did at the time. And uh, and so I, like I just wanted to break away from all the negative shit that had happened in the past and just go with a new way. And I love the new name and the logo and everything. So yeah, I was a uh, I was really happy to rebrand. It wasn't okay. it wasn't a necessity thing. It was because I wanted to make everything better. Okay. All right. Well, if I well, basically the point I'm making is if you haven't read some of the old articles, they're worth reading. So get yourself on uh, a plate string, look, check through the archives, and re- read some of those. Uh, actually, one of the guys I worked with was so excited when I said I was interviewing you because you are his favorite, uh, you know, author uh, of all things strength. So, oh, that's amazing! Thank yeah, you. yeah, he was he was absolutely pumped uh, and and also gutted that he wasn't sat here. But he would have just. He well, just I, I hope. He I hope I uh, lived up to his expectations. Yeah, no, he would just been fanboying the whole time. It'd have been embarrassing. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, Jay- people will quote, they'll quote me back to myself, and I go, and I'm like, oh, that's an awesome quote. They're like, you said that. I'm like, yeah. no, this is right, it. Cool. This is it. He's he's got on his laptop. He's got like your best quotes, and they'll pop up again. Oh, this, you know, check this out. And it just then then he just goes in and reads it out to me. <laughs> it's, it's fucking hilarious. You know anyway, what? If you could, have him get in touch with me because somebody said they wanted me to do some kind of like quote thing of the day for them out of my writing and i i was like how the fuck would i do that i have no idea i'm not rereading all that stuff uh, so uh, uh, yeah like i might be able to help them and we can we can one hand can watch the other there yeah yeah i'll have a word with greg get him uh, get him your your best quotes and, uh, and and get them sent over on an email awesome oh, oh. Jay- jamie thank you again it's been a pleasure um maybe we'll get you on another time if you're up for it to, uh, to chat yeah, absolutely i'd love to come back fantastic all right i will uh, i'll speak to you soon